Good morning and welcome to Stockport Baptist Online. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Now if you feel like you've maybe lost some of your zing today, it, it is after all uh, the week that began with Blue Monday, so who could blame you? Um, but I'll just invite you to uh, remember with me the, the words of David when he was struggling in the Judean wilderness. And he said this, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. So however you're feeling today, may we be among those who earnestly seek God, even when things seem parched and dry. And together, let's sing a hallelujah. Let's worship with everything we've got. Here we go. Louder and louder, you're 
gonna hear all my praises roar out from the ashes hope will arise when death is defeated the king is alive I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah Now Steve will be speaking today from John's Gospel, looking at the, the story of the calling of Nathaniel. And one of the parallel passages to this um, is way back in the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Samuel, where we read about the, the calling of the boy Samuel at a time in Israel's history that was very dark. And we read this in 1 Sam Samuel chapter 3. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. He was the priest. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then, the Lord called Samuel. The word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Eli, the priest, could barely see, not just physically. The lamp of God, symbolic of God's presence, which was to be kept burning continually throughout all generations, was only just a light. The nation was in spiritual darkness. And yet in the midst of that darkness, God called Samuel. Samuel later to become the righteous leader of God's people. Samuel, the one who anointed King David. It's a great encouragement to know that even in the most difficult of times, God does not forget us. He does not forsake us. And often at the 11th hour, he calls his faithful ones to take up their positions to carry out his plans. Do you remember the old HMV record label? It's the picture of the, um, the dog sat next to the, uh, the, the gramophone. And um, he's listening to the sound coming from it. And, and, and it's it's actually um, based on real-life events. It was, it was painted originally by a uh, Liverpool-based artist, Francis Barode, and it's called His Master's Voice. And it, it comes about because um, Francis's brother, Mark, died. Um, but before he died, he left, he left several recordings on this, this early um, medium. And whenever Francis would, would play the the sound of Mark's voice, Mark's dog, Nipper, would race over to the gramophone and sit next to it, listening to it intently, listening to his master's voice. He truly recognised it. And so in the context of, of today's message, thinking about God's call on our lives, individually and, and as a church, two questions arise. Do we recognise our Master's voice, God's voice? And do we understand what he's saying? Perhaps we expect, like Samuel, to, um, to have some sort of you know, real audible um, voice in our ear. And maybe that does happen for some people. But in reality, God uses many mediums, many ways of speaking to us, as this poem declares. Why do you want me to speak? Is not my presence sufficient for you? The kiss of my love in the sunlight, or the scent of my being on a flower? Why do you want me to speak? 
when I hook you in the embrace of a friend, when I move you by the fall of a song, when I show you the scars of my hands. Why do you ask me to speak when I use other voices, not mine? For mine is the cry of the stranger, the hungry, the prisoner, the poor. Why do you ask me to speak when I've spoken so often before? Heed my world, read my word, seek my child, and then you will hear me.
As soon as Philip met Jesus, he went looking for his friend Nathaniel and found him sitting in the shade of a fig tree. Nathaniel, Philip called, we've found the one, the one that Moses and the prophets promised. It's Jesus, the one from Nazareth. Nazareth, Nathaniel exclaimed, you've got to be kidding. Can anything good come out of that God-forsaken town? But Philip invited him along. Come, see for yourself. When Jesus saw Nathanael walking towards him, he said, Now here's a real Israelite, not a false bone in his body. Where did you get that idea? Nathanael asked. You don't know me. Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree long before Philip found you. Teacher, Nathaniel exclaimed, you must be the son of God, the king of Israel. Wow, you believe just because I said I saw you under the fig tree? Jesus laughed. You haven't seen anything yet. So let's pray. Dear God, reveal to us through your spirit the truth contained in this passage. May our eyes and hearts be opened to the proclamation of your word. Amen. So this passage is all about Jesus calling the disciples. Apparently he just said, follow me. And they gave up their livelihoods and families to follow him. Minding their own business when this complete stranger walks past turns to them and says something really quite strange to them. Follow me. If I'd have been one of them, I would have wanted answers to a few questions. Why should we follow you? Who are you? Are you some kind of lunatic? But how do they respond? It says at once they left their nets and followed him. But that doesn't really make any sense. Nobody in their right mind gives up their family businesses that they've worked hard for years to build up, to leave their families and their loved ones to follow a complete stranger, not knowing where they were going or what they were doing. It just doesn't seem to make any sense. Until we take a closer look at scripture, all four gospels tell of the calling of the disciples, all from a slightly different viewpoint. So we need to piece these together. And if we pull together the information in John, we find that Andrew and his companion are disciples of John the Baptist. And they spend the day with Jesus, causing Andrew to return to his brother Peter and tell him that they have found the Messiah. The next day, Peter, Andrew, John, Philip and Nathaniel accompany Jesus on a three day journey back to Galilee where they attend the wedding at Cana and see Jesus perform his first miracle. Some time later, according to Matthew and Mark, Jesus sees Peter and Andrew as they are fishing with their business partners, James and John, and asks them to follow him, and they do. In response, the men pull up their boats, leave everything and follow Jesus. But did they know what Jesus was calling them to? Well, no, not really. They had no idea what lay ahead that they would spend three years with Jesus as he performed signs and wonders and then be handed over to the authorities who would crucify him. I'm not sure they would have been so quick to follow him if they did know. And is it not the same for all of his followers, for you and me? I can distinctly remember the moment when I felt God calling me and I went down on my knees, figuratively if not literally, and said yes to that calling. And I'm sure it was the same for every one of you. There was a time in your life when you answered the call to put your trust in Jesus and follow him. But you probably had no idea what or where he was calling you to. So that's the question that I want us to look at this morning. What is God calling us to? As members of the worldwide church and also as members of his local church here at Stockport. And does it matter what we do in response to that calling? Or is it sufficient to know that we have been called and we have responded to that call and therefore we have the certainty of being saved? Well, let me make it perfectly clear from the outset. 
that I believe in the Apostle Paul's doctrine found in Ephesians 2. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is the doctrine of sola fide that ushered in the Reformation, when Martin Luther pinned his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, expounding his belief that it is by faith alone that we are saved. We cannot earn salvation by works. It is a work of grace. And I 100% agree with that statement, as I'm sure we all do. But for many years, I wrestled with the relationship between faith and works. I completely understood Paul's assertion. But what about James's view of it in chapter two of his letter? Where he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. So how to reconcile these two seemingly opposite views? Can you have one without the other? Are our works the poor relation to faith? Well, no, they're not. They're more like two blades of a pair of scissors. They only work when they work together. One cannot work without the other. And I have come to realize that even though we are saved by grace through faith, we are judged according to our works. Let me say that again. We are saved by grace through faith, but we are judged according to our works. If you look through the New Testament, looking for the words judge or judgment, you will find that we are judged by our works. Just listen to this sample of verses from the Bible about judgment. Chapter two of Romans has a title, God's righteous judgment. And verse six says this, God will repay each person according to what they have done. And then in Revelation, we find these words. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And then we have this verse from Corinthians. For we, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. 2 Corinthians 5.10. And finally, in Matthew 25, we have the illustration of the sheep and the goats. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Being judged is not the same as being condemned. And being saved means a lot more than not being judged. Good works are not the cause of our salvation. Good works are the evidence of our salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. But getting back to the original question, what are we being called to? Well, I would argue that once we accept the call from Jesus, then we are called to show our faith by producing good works or good deeds, as it says in Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. All good works, as it says in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So let me ask you a question. If you were sent before a judge this morning, 
accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And what kind of evidence would they be looking for? Surely they'd be uh, looking for evidence of good works. Isn't that what James meant when he said, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. And when did church become more about meeting on a Sunday morning for 90 minutes and less about what we all do for the rest of the week? There's no doubt that church generally has become more consumer driven. A place to come on a Sunday morning to absorb and receive, a place to listen to someone else opening the word and sharing some teaching from it, a place to join in the worship and prayers, have some after service fellowship, and then go home until we meet again next Sunday. This model of Sunday morning church isn't a recent phenomenon. This has been going on for centuries. Chris Stoddard, who was director of a, a Christian organization called RUN, Reaching the Unchurched, makes the point that if we were able to bring some church leaders from the 19th century forward in time to the present day, we would quite rightly expect them to be completely overwhelmed and confused by the world that they found themselves in. Practically every aspect of society and the culture surrounding them, they would find very different from their own. We would expect them to feel disorientated, confused, insecure, until, that is, they stepped into one of our churches where the chances are they would feel instantly at home. Now, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with gathering together for worship. The early church devoted itself to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. But they also ran food banks and looked after the sick, the elderly and the vulnerable. What John Wimber calls doing the stuff. Many of you will have heard of John Wimber, uh, the American pastor who founded the Vineyard group of churches. And he struggled with these same issues when he first became a Christian in the 1970s. And when I became a Christian, I thought that's what I was going to do. I spent several weeks reading the New Testament and talking with these people. And I thought, this is great. You know, I'm going to join up. I want to do this stuff. And so I remember the frustration of attending church the first few times. You know what I thought they did at church? Now, this is how stupid I was. I thought you, that people gathered at the church, had a good time together, sort of divvied up the land, and everybody went out and healed a few, and cast out a few demons, and won a few people to Christ before lunch. And so the first few times I went to church, I went prepared with the idea that we're going to, you know, ha, I'm going to take Anaheim. I want to go to Anaheim, you know the deepest, darkest pagan Anaheim, over there by Disneyland. That's where I want to go, because that's where I was raised. And when they didn't do it, I was disappointed. And I remember one day asking a guy about it. I said, well, when do we go out and do it? He said, what? I said, when do we go out and do it? He says, oh, you don't have to do it. You just have to believe it was done once. <laughs> now, that's pathetic. <laughs> Isn't it? I found out over the next year or two that we cried about it, we sang about it, we preached about it, we prayed over it, we gave to it, but we never did it. We never got to go do the things that Jesus did. And I grew disillusioned in the process. Now, you know, when I worked for the devil, he let me do his stuff. So if we are to be judged in our works, our stuff, how does SBC measure up and what does the future hold? Can we reimagine how we might improve the stuff that we do? Well, let me share um, a part of a reflection that Christine Cheatham sent me. She had been thinking about SBC's strapline, more than just church. And she asked the question, what does the phrase more than just church imply? Are we implying something more than just Sunday morning worship? 
or more than just a building or something extra outside of the worshipping community. And she suggests that we need to open our eyes to see all that is currently happening. And this resonated with something that was said at the Zoom discussion uh, last Sunday. Exodus 4.2 was felt to be important, which says what was in their hand. And if we apply that to Stockport, what is in our hand? And if we look at the list of good works that Christine mentioned that the church is involved in, it includes, but is not restricted to, the following. Energize. Loaves and Fishers, Thursday at One, Iranian Ministry, the Olive Branch, Small Groups, the Food Bank, Mental Health Groups, Women's Refuge, Stockport Prayer Breakfast, Christians in Schools, Olive Rock, Renew Stockport, Farsi Women's Support Group, Gazebo Days, Holiday Clubs in the Park, the Bethlehem Experience. We are or have been involved with lots of stuff, but maybe we haven't got the balance right yet between word and works between services and stuff. Myself and Ken believe that lockdown has given us the opportunity to reset and reevaluate, to look at the balance between our Sunday services and the rest of the ministries that the church is involved in. And as Ken said last week in his message, the Queen has been removed and we've been forced to stop our Sunday services. So now is the time to look at our vision with new eyes and to ask the question what do we mean more than just church to look at how we can adapt our services how we can use our building more creatively how we can engage with those outside the church more effectively to be people that pray lord enlarge our vision to reimagine what church might be after lockdown in conclusion what are we as the disciples of Jesus Christ and as members of his church being called to? I believe we are called to be doers of the word as well as hearers of the word. Jesus does not want hearers of the word. He wants us to be like the wise man who heard the sayings of Jesus and went out and did them. That's like building your house on the rock and not to be like the foolish man who heard the sayings of Jesus, but did not do them. That's like building your house on sand. That's what I believe God is calling us to, not just to hear the sayings of Jesus, but to put them into practice and build Stockport Baptist Church on the solid rock so that when the floods come and the winds blow and COVID hits, we will not fall. Amen.
what is in your hand? What skills, abilities, resources, passions are a part of you that, that you can give? As together we consider uh, that more than just church. As we seek that, that rebalancing of words and works, services and stuff. It's worth noting that John Wimber, um, whose uh, video clip you saw in Steve's message, he, he came from a background of like n no church experience. He had no idea about the Bible, no, no real Christian heritage. He was actually a rock musician uh, when he started uh, to, to read the words of Jesus and, and his heart warms towards him. And it was through that, that passion to know Jesus more and to do the things that Jesus did that he, over time, um, started leading a, a small group that became a church, that became the vineyard movement of churches. Uh, it's a movement of which myself and Sharon were a part for quite some time. And, and he and his movement impacted many churches across the world and in the UK. And it was through the vineyard movement that actually Alpha came about um, in, in London. So that, you know, that, that what started with just this passion of the one man to, to know Jesus and to do the things that Jesus did has, has had far-reaching consequences for God and his kingdom. Closer to home uh, this week, some of you know that um, we run a midweek um, study for Farsi speakers with the help of Ben to translate. And um, it's been running, well, since, since lockdown started. And uh, we have, as part of our group, um, a number of people um, from Iran. And, uh, and this week, uh, one of our group members, who's been with us several months, um, she, she, she joined as a, an explorer, really. She, she was investigating for herself Christian faith. Does this make sense? Is this something she wants to, to um, have in her life? And uh, she came to the point this week of saying, yes, to Jesus. Yes, I want to open my heart to Jesus and to live as a Christian. Given all the, the risks that that involves for her. And um, that's remarkable. Remarkable. So in all the, the, the darkness and, and, and depression of COVID and lockdown and all the implications... Um, we have some little jewels, some little nuggets of things that are happening. This is church, people. So, what is in your hand? I'm going to say this prayer written by um, the well-known author A.W. Tozer. And uh, I'll just invite you to join me in saying it as you feel able. I come to you today, Lord to give up my rights, to lay down my life, to offer my future, to give my devotion, my skills, my energies. I shall not waste time deploring my weaknesses nor my unfittedness for the work. I acknowledge your choice with my life to make Christ attractive and intelligible to those around me. I come to you for spiritual preparation. Put your hand upon me. Anoint me with the oil of the one with good news. Save me from compromise. Heal my soul from small ambitions. Deliver me from the itch to always be right. Save me from wasting time. I accept hard work. I ask for no easy place. Help me not to judge others who walk a smoother path. Show me those things that diminish spiritual power in a soul. I now consecrate my days to you. Make your will more precious than anybody or anything. Fill me with your power and when at the end of life's journey I see you face to face, may I hear those undeserving words, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
Well, I hope you've been challenged and inspired today. It's been great sharing this time with you. And uh, just to remind you that um, if, if you want to join us in any way during the week, there are several opportunities. Um, this week there is a, a church prayer meeting on Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock, and uh, that will be on Zoom. And then on Wednesday and Thursday evenings are regular weekly uh, small groups meeting on Zoom, both in English and in Farsi. So if you'd like to, to check out any of those and don't know how, you can make contact with us through um, messaging on Facebook or uh, YouTube and we'll get back in touch with you. But for now, a Celtic blessing to send you on your way. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Yeah.
We're singing mad.